You are listening to the Logos Radio Network. LogosRadioNetwork.com Say live and let die Good evening and welcome to Live and Let Live on the Logos Radio Network. I'm Gary Johnson. You can hear this program every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 8 Central, 7 Mountain, and 6 Pacific. Archives of this program are available at logosradionetwork.com. Well, tonight in our first hour, we're going to be talking with Carla Howell. She is Executive Director of the Libertarian Party. But she's going to spend much of the time telling us about how she led a petition drive which put on the ballot in Massachusetts a referendum question to repeal the state income tax, and it came remarkably close to passing. Uh, she'll also talk to us about another effort uh, to uh, deal with the state sales tax in Massachusetts. And she's going to tell us the truth about Mitt Romney because she actually ran against uh, Mitt Romney, and so she knows all about him. Uh, Carla Howell, welcome to Live and Let Live. Thank you very much. Well, Carla, I would like for you to begin by telling us a little bit about the politics of Massachusetts, and in particular how it relates to uh, the state income tax there. Uh, what sort of state is Massachusetts politically? Well, as many people know, it's it's a big government state. Uh, of all the big government states in our country, there are 50 of them. Uh, Massachusetts ranks amongst the top five or so. Um, it's um, often um, referred to as democratic. It, the legislature is overwhelmingly de democratic. There is currently a Democrat governor, and all the statewide offices are held by Democrats. However, there really isn't much difference, if any difference, between um, today, uh, back in the 80s when Michael Dukakis was a governor, and in the uh, the governor administrations in between these two periods, which were held by Republicans from 1990 up until uh, Mitt Romney ended his term um, in 2006. Um, the Democrats and Republicans in Massachusetts vote big government. They vote for higher budgets. They vote for higher taxes. They oppose measures to shrink government. And Mitt Romney fit right neatly into that mold. All right. Now, Carla, I want to, even though we'll talk about the Libertarian Party and, and other things later in the hour, I want to spend a lot of time here talking about your effort to uh, repeal the state income tax, which uh, came very close. What was the, the vote on that? In 2002, the first time we ran and the income tax, we got 45% of the vote. Um, the polls had been saying we would get between 27 and 37 percent of the vote, so we we shocked everyone, and and pleasantly uh, can't say we were too surprised, but we were very pleased with the result of of 45 percent, and what that really says about Massachusetts and and probably you could make the same case about New York and California and Illinois and New Jersey, that you have centers in the state, basically in the big cities, Boston in our case, and some other smaller cities, as well as university towns, where you have overwhelming big government um, political um, inclinations. But you go out into the suburbs or in the rural areas of Massachusetts, and it's really demographically much more the rest of, like the rest of the country. And that is they're pretty much ordinary, um, uh, lower middle income, working people, taxpayers, who want government to be much smaller than it is, want taxes to be lower, and want government spending to come down from where it is. And they're, and they're quite willing to have fewer government services as part of that trade-off. So Massachusetts, like many states, is a mix. It's controlled by the power brokers, the big government, uh, Democrats and Republicans. But the people of Massachusetts, especially outside of the cities and the university towns, are much like Americans everywhere. All right. Now, uh, can you tell us a little bit about 
the the income tax in Massachusetts. What kind of income tax do you have? I live in Texas. We don't even, even have an income tax. But is it the same as the federal income tax, but an extra um, percentage amount, or is it a completely different form? Or and and how much of a tax income tax do they have in Massachusetts? What kind of income tax does Massachusetts have? Massachusetts has a flat 5.3 percent income tax. Um, lucky. F- for us, the Constitution forbids it from being a graduated income tax. Otherwise, I'm sure they would have hiked it for the upper income levels a long, long time ago, but they've been constitutionally prohibited from doing that. Nonetheless, the 5.3%, which is a, a somewhat average income tax if you look around the country, is but one of their major taxes. We have a uh, now six and a quarter percent sales tax. They raised it from 5.0 a few years ago. They also have high property taxes, especially in certain towns, and fees everywhere you turn. It's it, there's probably few states that can compete with Massachusetts in terms of the fees that you pay, professional fees. You know, getting on a ferry ride, mower, mooring a boat, uh, renewing your gun license. All these things um, have very high fees. They're all over the place. We also have some of, if not the highest, corporate uh, taxes in the in the country. So if you add up all of Massachusetts taxes, they're onerous. They're hostile to pri- the private sector and to small businesses. Um, so that it, it is been dubbed Taxachusetts. The politicians there like to pretend it's no longer Taxachusetts, but it absolutely is. All right. Now, Carla, you, you said it's a 5.3% uh, flat rate. Does that mean that everybody, even someone who has virtually no income, just above zero, pays the state income tax? Correct. And the exemptions, there's relatively few. It's pretty much a tax on your first dollar earned. All right. Now, you, uh, as you will explain to us, you uh, led a petition drive to put this on the ballot. Why did you think that this had a chance? I mean, you, you described Massachusetts as being, I guess, two places, the, the elite in the cities and the ordinary people out in the country. But what gave you an idea that, that this would even have a chance in a place called Taxachusetts? Well, we didn't know. Where, what was going to happen with it. It was an idea that was conceived by my uh, partner, Michael Cloud, who was living in Massachusetts at the time. Um, he and I later formed the Center for Small Government and have been involved in, he's been involved in politics in this country for 40 years, uh, uh, also dubbed the Master of Libertarian Persuasion, and an expert communications, expert speechwriter, and political strategist, amongst other things. And he came up with the idea back in nine in uh, nine. It would have been two thousand one of putting this on the ballot in Massachusetts. And and I at first said, "Can we do that? Can we actually mm-hmm. end the income tax and be like New Hampshire, our neighbor, or Texas, or other? There's nine states that have no income tax." Um, and he said, "Why not?" And I thought for a few seconds and said. Why not? So, because most ballot initiatives in Massachusetts is lucky to be one of about um, 22 states that have a statewide ballot initiative process, and of those 22 states, there's only about 10 or 15 where it's viable, meaning where the requirements aren't so difficult that you can actually get an initiative on the ballot. Massachusetts is one of those states. So, we were lucky to live in a state where that was an option though it's very difficult to do and expensive and you have to work awfully hard to do it, it is possible to do it. So we said, let's try it. You know, um, one of the things that we need to do to change high government spending, high taxes in this country is we need to run campaigns, whether it's individuals running for office or ballot initiatives that put out their proposals to shrink government, just like Ron Paul proposed reducing the federal government by $1 trillion in the first year, a very bold proposal relative to what people propose today, but a very necessary one. Uh, Gary Johnson, running on the Libertarian ticket, um, has proposed uh, something similar, a 43% cut in federal spending. We need to put proposals out there and have them do uh, as they do. Now, what we have discovered with our 45% vote is that when you propose something bold like that, you do pretty much as well as when you propose something very modest. And a lot of people will argue, well, it has to be very modest and a smaller cut or 
or, or no one will do it. it. It'll be too radical, or they'll claim something to this effect. But in in reality, the re, the radicalness in politics today is the big government and Democrats and Republicans who are spending through the roof, very very recklessly and very very dangerously. To simply bring the ba- the budget into balance is normal <laughs> and responsible. And our and the income tax, when we looked at the numbers in Massachusetts, was um, would have only begun to remove the waste in state government spending. It would have been there would have been much more that you could have cut than the what would have been back back in 2002 billion dollars to adjust for that reduction in revenue from ending the income tax. It was absolutely doable. It was a first step towards small government to a constitutional government. Um, so we put it out there. We got 45 percent of the vote. Another measure to um, reduce the income tax in 1990 by a very tiny amount got only 40 percent of the vote. So what we demonstrated by getting 45% of the vote is there's no reason to be shy or timid. There's everything to gain in putting a nice, bold, and attractive proposal on the table there because it does just as well. And it, in another state, it might have passed. Right. Well, I, that's you said you got 45% of the vote to repeal the income tax in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, that's to me just astonishing. I mean, you, even though you didn't quite make it, that is, you know, uh, I really was surprised because repealing the income tax is a very uh, significant uh, uh, change. Uh, we're going to come up on a break in a little less than two minutes here, Carla, but I want you to begin telling us what you had to go through just to get this on the ballot. Okay. Go right ahead and start right now. I'll okay. cut you off. <laughs> All right. In Massachusetts, um, the signature requirement, you have to do two signature drives, not just one, but two. Um, The first one requires, it it varies every year. It's dependent on the vote of the prior governor's race in the the prior election. But it's in the ballpark of about 67,000 signatures, which may not sound like a lot compared to some states where you need hundreds of thousands of signatures. But actually in Massachusetts, because the laws are so... Um, difficult. Um, you could say somewhat crazy. <laughs> you, for example, when you collect signatures in Massachusetts, you can't get any stray marks on your petition sheet. If somebody so much as puts a tiny little pen mark on your sheet, every signature on, the, signature on that page will be thrown out and not counted. Um, you have to put the signatures on separate sheets for every single one of the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, which is very clumsy and awkward when you're trying to collect signatures, for instance, at a shopping center or on the street, and you're, you know, people are, are walking by, and they're all from different towns, and you're ruffling through these papers. <laughs> so it's a very challenging process. All right. Uh, Carla Howell will continue describing her experience in uh, 2002, putting a ballot proposition on the uh, ballot in uh, Massachusetts to repeal the state income tax. It got 45% of the vote. Uh, She is executive director of the Libertarian Party. If you'd like to know more about the Libertarian Party, their website is www.lp.org. This is Live and Let Live on the Logos Radio Network. I'm Gary Johnson. We are talking with Carla Howell. She is executive director of the Libertarian Party. Their website is www.lp.org. She has been with the Center for Small Government, and uh, she's been telling us about a project of theirs in Massachusetts, which uh, came close to repealing the uh, state income tax. Uh, their website is www.center for small government.com. And Carla was telling us how in 2002, uh, their organization uh, petitioned to put on the ballot a proposal to repeal the state income tax. And as we were going to a break, she was telling us about how difficult it is uh, to uh, get a petition uh, drive in Massachusetts, how uh, I guess the petition is easily challenged if you have just a stray mark on your uh, petition. And she said that there are, you actually had to conduct uh, two petition drives. Uh, Carla, uh, what was this two petition drive uh, issue all about? Uh, we don't know how, why they wrote that rule in the Constitution a hundred years ago, why they, you know, 
there's sort of a justification. The way it's supposed to work is you get your first batch of signatures, then it goes to the legislature for a vote, and then they have four months to vote on it. And if they don't, if they vote it into law, you're done. If they don't, you have to go and get a second batch of signatures. Why? We don't know. And after you've achieved that, then it goes on the ballot. All right. So I take it that after you got your first passage of signatures, the Massachusetts legislature didn't say, yeah, let's repeal the income tax. How clever of you to figure that out. <laughs> nope. In fact, they, they ignored it and tried to pretend it didn't even exist. And this has happened before with ballot initiatives, and the courts have ruled that if they don't even take the vote, it is considered a no vote, and it is allowed to proceed to as if there had been no vote and, and get the second batch of signatures to qualify for the ballot. So that is what happened every time we ran a ballot initiative in Massachusetts. When you were petitioning, Carla, uh, what sort of response did you get? Generally very positive, and it's very, very interesting because a lot of people will make the assertion that the, in the people who would oppose an income tax are the wealthy. Well, that's not what you discover petitioning in Massachusetts because in the wealthy towns, uh, those were the most difficult to petition in. The working class towns middle and lower income towns, short of going into, uh, you know, the very, very poorest where you have housing projects and, uh, and apartment buildings um, and, you know, tough neighborhoods, uh, but everything in between, the, the lower and middle income tax, lower and middle income working families, these were the ones who were most receptive to ending the income tax, especially amongst the working poor. They would practically grab the, the petition clipboard out of your hand and say, how do I sign more than once? I mean, it was, there was genuine enthusiasm amongst these folks. And, and we figured the reason is because they, um, they see government programs around them. They see the housing project up the street. They know people on welfare and food stamps and all kinds of government programs. And they see that they don't work, that people abuse them, and, um, and they're out working for a living and getting relatively nothing, retiring on relatively nothing, struggling to get by, and seeing government waste all around them. A lot of these folks are very, very supportive of vending the income tax, also because they're, they're really tight and they need every penny they can get back in their family budget. So, they, so it was very easy to petition in these towns. In the wealthy towns, where so many people today who have money have their money as a function of big government, either their unions getting cushy deals and cushy pensions, or their government contractors you know, making double what they would make for the same contract in the private sector, uh, many of them accumulate, accumulating a lot of wealth. Uh, some of them could be government employees, university employees, where they're, they're employees of the state, making healthy six-figure incomes with all kind of benefits. These towns were, were relatively cool towards us about signing this petition because their livelihood was coming, in many cases, from government even though they would benefit from no income tax, they would be, in their view, um, pay a much higher price in, in perhaps a loss of their job altogether. So the wealthy communities did not respond nearly as well to our offers to sign a petition to end the income tax. All right, Carla. So you got enough signatures, I take it, and you got it on the ballot. And so you now begin your campaign. Is that right? Correct. And so uh, how did the press treat your uh, ballot initiative? Well, the first time we did it very, very poorly. Uh, we weren't taken seriously. Um, the opposition spent no money. They were polling and, and the newspapers were polling and there was a little there was some publicity, but no one expected us to even come close. Um, and so they I think they didn't want people to be aware of it. I think they, very deliberately blacked us out, wouldn't cover our campaign. We pleaded with the Boston Globe, pleaded with the um, ABC, NBC, uh, CBS, news affiliates, PBS, uh, 
Boston Herald, you know, we got little blips here and there, and closer to the ex- election, we got a little more. But they did what they could to black us out effectively. So um, many people were not even aware that it was on the ballot. They discovered it when they grabbed their ballot and saw this question saying, do you want to end the income tax? And a lot of them said, yeah. <laughs> so we did quite right. well in spite of that. Now, the, in the subsequent two elections, the second attempt to end the income tax and the 2010 effort to roll back the sales tax, the teachers' unions and other powers that be profiteers of big government realized they couldn't just sit back and hope. Forty-five percent was way too close. So then they started rolling out millions of dollars in TV ads and other advertisements to drive down our numbers and keep us down. We actually polled above 50 percent in both of those campaigns, especially in the 2010 campaign. But we were not a well-funded campaign. We, we you know, were, you know, struggling to get by, uh, mouth-to-mouth kind of campaign. Our opponents had millions of dollars at, the, at their disposal, and they run, ran a total of $12 million in ads between those, those two campaigns to keep us from winning. Now, our vote total still went up a little bit each time, but stayed below 50%. We did not win any of the three ballot initiatives, but we cost them $12 million they had to spend all that money just to keep the the taxes from going down, and we got our message out in a big way and really established the viability of bold tax cuts, even in the state like Massachusetts, which sends a message to every other state that if this can be done in Massachusetts and you've got a ballot initiative in your state, look into it, because this is one of the most potent tools that those of us who love freedom have at our disposal, and it's something we need to take much more advantage of. Yes. Now, as you were telling us, we were talking about the 2002 vote, and then you had, another, and that was to repeal the state income tax. In 2008, you had a vote, and was that essentially the same question as in 2002? Essentially the same, yes. And then in 2010, you had a proposal to uh, roll back the uh, state sales tax from uh, uh, whatever the percentage it was to a lower percentage. Is that right? Correct. From six and a quarter percent to three percent. We were cutting it in half plus a slight bit more than that. Okay. Now, as you said, in 2002, you uh, uh, were blacked out by the media, which was the bad news, but also the opposition wasn't really uh, fighting against you, which was kind of the good news. Uh, In uh, 2008, the opposition uh, threw everything they could against you. And uh, the the interesting thing to me that you said, Carla, is that the leader of the opposition was the teachers' union. But why was the teacher union so interested in this? Well, they are some of the major recipients of state and local government pork and largesse. They have huge pensions, um, especially the older um, teachers, the ones that are approaching retirement, uh, recently retired. They are getting, in many cases, uh, in fact, typically 80 percent of their their highest salary in their last three years of employment, um, that that pension automatically increases. Um, it's what's called a defined benefit. So unlike your IRA that may be worth half its value if there's a market crash, their benefits are predefined, have nothing to do with the market. If the market goes down and their pension funds can't cover it, they take it right out of your tax dollars. So it's a guaranteed amount of a pension. Generous health care benefits, all kinds of things they're protecting by fighting us. All right, we are talking with Carla Howell. She is the executive director of the Libertarian Party, and she is telling us about the campaigns, especially the one in 2002, to repeal the state income tax in Massachusetts, a campaign that almost succeeded. You are listening to Live and Let Live on the Logos Radio Network. I'm Gary Johnson. We are talking with Carla Howell. She is executive director of the Libertarian Party. Their website is www.lp.org. She is telling us about her activism with the Center for Small Government. Uh, Their website is www.centerforsmallgovernment.com. 
and uh, she's uh, telling us about uh, petition drives that they did in Massachusetts, in particular uh, drives in 2002 and 2008 to repeal the state income tax, as well as a petition drive in 2010 to cut the uh, state sales tax by more than half. And uh, she was telling us about how uh, in 2002, uh, the press uh, basically refused to cover their uh, ballot initiative, and uh, they actually came very close to winning. They got 45% of the vote, which apparently surprised everybody. Uh, and so that when they tried it again in 2008, uh, the uh, opposition did not uh, roll over, and uh, they spent literally, literally millions of dollars, like on television commercials, to fight back against this ballot proposal to repeal the uh, income tax in uh, tax Massachusetts. And uh, Carla was explaining to us that the teachers union was a major uh, force in uh, putting up money for these uh, uh, commercials. Uh, Carla, where did the money for these uh, commercials come from? The Massachusetts Teachers Association um, was what was the primary opponent, and they have a relationship with the um, teachers union in Washington, D.C., there's the American Federation of Teachers and the, um, I'm sorry, it's slipping my mind, with the federal version. National the Education National Association? The NEA, right, National Education Association. Those two federal groups put in millions of dollars, as did the state uh, union organizations. Uh, a relatively small portion of the total funding of, of the opposition to ending the income tax and rolling back the sales tax came from some other big government profiteers in Massachusetts, some insurance companies, some construction companies that got, uh, for instance, projects with the Big Dig construction project in downtown Boston. Um, but it was overwhelmingly funded by the teachers' union. Now, what... Uh what was their argument, Carla? What did their well, commercials the main, say? Yeah, the main argument that they use is what we call the sky is falling. Uh, they basically threaten to uh, say they, and try to claim that it is absolutely unavoidable that if we cut this tax that we will have to cut police and firefighters, your neighborhoods will be unsafe, your house could burn down, we'll have to cut teachers in the schools, and your kid won't get a good education, or we won't be able to repair the roads and and uh, keep an accident from happening. They basically use scare tactics. And rather than talk about the waste in the state government, of which there are billions of dollars, they try to effectively threaten voters into and and con them into believing that the absolute only place they can cut is in the areas that people care the most about. Their prioritization of spending cuts is deliberately very, very bad, reckless, and unfair. And they, a lot of voters get wise to this, and they, they realize that it's a blackmail and a threat, but they're still afraid of losing those services. And so it does work. It's a tactic that works. It's been tried and true. It's, it's used in every state in the country. Um, it's the primary argument used against those who try to cut government spending in any serious way, and often the people who, who even suggest cutting it in a non-serious way. They basically use the same arguments, threaten people, claim the sky will fall if they don't keep getting the existing tax revenue that's coming in the door. Now, the first time you get 45%, what happened in uh, 2008? We got a lower percentage but a higher vote total. 2008 was a presidential year, and it was also the year Obama was elected. It was a record-breaking turnout. And so what happened in that year was the Obama campaign brought out a lot of Democrats, about a half a million more Democrat, big government Democrat voters than normal, almost all of whom voted against this income tax repeal. So this caused our vote total to go down. We also had the advertising running for the first time, and there was plenty of it, $7 million. Um, and we did not have an ad budget to respond to that. So our vote total percentage went down, but our vote total actually went up by a bit and broke 900000 in that in that year. All right. Now, Carla, um 
What was your counter argument when they you sort of stated it here, but when yeah. the uh, you know the opposition said all the sky is going to fall, what did you say? Well, we pointed out that this was a manipulation and a scare tactic, and we would turn the conversation to government waste. We talked about both specific programs, and we had we pointed to our website, uh, the last one being rollbacktaxes.com, and said, you know, click on the link about government waste, and you will see a long, long list of areas where they can cut government. In addition, they can simply cut waste throughout government. Waste is mar is marbled throughout government spending. Virtually every government agency, department, uh, uh, bureaucracy has tons and tons of waste. It's safe to say, I will assert, that you could cut any government budget in this country, state, local, or federal, immediately by 10 percent just by removing the obvious waste. You could cut much more, often more than 50 percent of total spending by really getting in there and removing all the programs that don't work, that aren't worth the money. In many cases, that actually do more harm than good. There's plenty of places to cut, and the opposition likes to pretend they do not exist and really threaten to cut all the areas that they have figured out voters care the most about. All right. So, Carla, you tried to repeal the state income tax in Massachusetts in 2002 and 2008. You tried to uh, cut back the state sales tax in 2010. What lessons did you learn from this and what lessons do you have for people in other states? Well, the biggest lesson, as I mentioned earlier, is, is don't be shy. Don't uh, be bold. Um, propose dramatic cuts in government for a number of reasons. For one, because to just to get people's attention, and it's hard if you're on cutting government. Uh, I'm now the executive director for the Libertarian Party, and libertarians um, want much less government, as most Americans do. Uh, but they're often shut out or discredited or treated very poorly by the the press, even when they make the ballot and are perfectly legitimate candidates. Now, one that is wrong and should be corrected, but we can't necessarily do that ourselves. So one of the ways that we can break through is by offering bold proposals, such as ending the income tax, if whether you're running for state office, federal office, you could propose repealing the federal income tax, cutting spending dramatically by over a trillion dollars in the case of the federal government, state Government can, governments can be cut by billions, if not tens of billions of dollars easily. Local governments can be cut by millions, in some cases billions. And we should run on these things and not be shy about it and ask them to apologize for why they have been abusing taxpayers, wasting gobs of money, running up our debt, risking hyperinflation, and doing great harm to this country. Um, so the trick is... Get out there and run, whether it's a ballot initiative or as a libertarian candidate, uh, and come out swinging for dramatically shrinking government and showing the voters why their lives will be so much better. In the case of rolling by, back the sales tax, it would have created 30,000 new jobs. It would have put about seven, dollars $800 back in the family budget of the average working taxpayer in the state. It would have uh, brought in more retail business from the surrounding states, many of which are flocking to New Hampshire, where they have not only no income tax but no sales tax. So we're constantly losing business to our neighbor, neighboring state of New Hampshire. We would be able to keep much more of our business um, in Massachusetts. We would also attract foreigners who would come to shop in Massachusetts more. There was everything to be gained by the vast majority of people in Massachusetts. So it was only the profiteers who are unfairly profiting from tax dollars who would have had to find new jobs. Everybody else would have been doing much, much better and and that's what we got to do. We got to keep putting out proposals, candidates, ballot initiatives for shrinking government. And the Libertarian Party is the party that does that the most and the best. So I, I strongly recommend come to LP.org, check it out, and we will have more and more candidates as the year goes on. We have we have a presidential nominating convention the first weekend in May in Las Vegas. Um, 
We'll have a number of candidates competing for the nomination. The delegates there will select that nominee, and then we will be uh, running that presidential candidate through November. They will be in the general election. They will be running against Obama and whoever the Republican may be, um, and it's going to be a very exciting year, and this is how we do it. We run campaigns. All right. So that's it, folks. Be bold and get involved. Uh, we are talking with Carla Howell. As she said, she's the executive director of the Libertarian Party. Their website is www.lp.org. And she's been telling us about the Center for Small Government. Their website is www.centerforsmallgovernment.com. And Carla, I, I, we're coming up on a break here, but I understand you know a little bit about Mitt Romney. I do. I ran against him for governor in 2002, the same year we ran our first end income tax ballot initiative, which, of course, he opposed vehemently. Um, he opposed. All right. Well, Carla, opposed- I will let you tell us more about that after this uh, break. You're listening to Live and Let Live on the Logos Radio Network. I'm Gary Johnson. We now return to Live and Let Live on the Logos Radio Network. I'm Gary Johnson. We are talking with Carla Howell, Executive Director of the Libertarian Party. Their website is www.lp.org. And as Carla just told us before the break, uh, she knows a little bit about Mitt Romney, who is now running for president, because uh, she ran for governor of Massachusetts against him in 2002. Uh, So, Carla... Uh, you, I take it with the Libertarian Party candidate, and Mitt Romney was the Republican candidate, uh, and I believe he served just one term. Is that right? That's right. So that was the one and only time he ran for governor. Uh, so, what do you? What can you tell us about Mitt Romney? Mitt Romney is big government. Big government is Miss Mitt Romney. He is big government in every way. He hikes taxes, he hikes government spending, and he introduced the granddaddy of big government programs, Romney Care. Effectively the same thing as Obamacare, as Hillary Care, as Dukakis Care, which was which was uh, enacted under Governor Dukakis. Remember the guy with the tank and the helmet who ran against George Bush for president in 1988? That was our governor at the time, an extreme left wing big government Democrat, Romney, Hillary Care, Obamacare, Dukakis Care, they're all effectively the same thing. They mandate individuals and small businesses to to purchase health insurance, whether they can afford it or not, or face a tax penalty. That's what these programs are. That's what Mitt Romney championed. He didn't just sign it into law with the Democrats twisting his arms. He proposed it, lobbied for it, championed it, they locked arm in arm with Ted Kennedy and the Democrat legislature. It sailed through, and he that was his signature legislation, effectively the same thing as Obamacare. That's what this guy foisted on the taxpayers and voters of Massachusetts with no warning. He did not run on it, did not breathe a word of it during his campaign. He admitted, in fact, that he got this bright idea right after he was inaugurated. Um, this man is possibly the most dangerous politician in America. Um, The primary reason is not only is he dangerously big government, but he pretends not to be. He's running on the Republican ticket, pretending not to be. And he is uh, therefore going to get a pass and a buy from the majority of Republicans, as he did in Massachusetts, who did not do peep to fight this guy, protest him, or for all I know, not a single one of them even pulled him aside and said, excuse me, Mr. Romney, have you lost your mind? <laughs> they they let him just uh, run with this thing. No resistance. He has helped to create a new standard and to move the Republican Party even further into the solid big government camp, now becoming more and more accepting of the idea of uh, universal health care, socialized medicine. And Mitt Romney paid, played a major role in that, in addition to giving cover to President Obama to pass his legislation. Because what can the Democrats say when their leading candidate for this year's nomination so far is the person who who enacted exactly what Obama is most, uh, has brought the most disapproval of, of Obama amongst Republicans and, and independents, has ex- 
his extreme, dangerous, and reckless expansion of big government, his signature piece being Obamacare, just like Mitt Romney's. All right, now, you know, if you listen to Mitt Romney today, Carla, he says he's going to give waivers to all the states and he's going to repeal Obamacare, and he's really against it. Uh, and he says that it's different from Romney Care, and, and they're not the same. You're telling us that he championed this. It's not just something that the Democratic legislature is pushing through and he reluctantly signed it. It is called Romney Care because it was his baby from the beginning. It is effectively the same thing as Obamacare. Um, any claim to the contrary is just deceptive at a minimum deceptive, if not an outright lie. It is the same thing as Obamacare. He is the father of the individual mandate for medical insurance in this country. All right. Now, you said a moment ago, Carla, that he raised taxes. What, 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 how much did he raise taxes? What kind of taxes did he raise? Well, as Milton Friedman used to say, the late, great Milton Friedman, to know the true level of taxation, look at government spending. Because one way or another, they're going to get that out of you, especially very directly at the state level because they can't print money. So you're going to pay for it in either more debt on which you pay uh, interest and principal, or you're going to pay for it with taxes being raised here and there, um, uh, new taxes. In the case of Mitt Romney, he imposed scores of new taxes and increased taxes. He took a so-called no new taxes pledge when he ran for governor. It was a lie. It was a deception. Um, he liked to pretend that raising the, your gun license fee by three times is not a tax increase. It's a fee increase, and that doesn't count. Um, he passed legislation to enable the local cities and towns to raise business property tax. He closed loopholes so that the Internet sales tax would apply to more people. Um, these are just a few of the very of the scores, dozens of taxes that he hiked his four years in governor. He increased spend, spending overall five billion dollars. That's five billion more every year that the taxpayers of Massachusetts are now forced to pay because of Mitt Romney. You uh, said he signed a no new taxes pledge, and but he raised taxes anyway. How did he? You said he just said, "Well, these aren't taxes; they're fees." Is that? Is that is the sum of his argument? Well, let me first be clear. If I if I said signed, I misspoke. He refused to actually sign that pledge. He said okay. he's a man of his word. He doesn't need to sign a piece of paper. He's just not going to raise taxes. And but of course, the first thing he did once he was inaugurated was propose a billion dollars in spending increases his first year and a pile of new taxes or expanded taxes to. Uh, make up for the for the to raise the needed revenue for that increase. He did this each of the four years that he was governor. At the end, he left us with five billion dollars more, plus this huge liability of Romney Care, which both imposed all kinds of fines and requirements to buy expensive and unnecessary insurance on the private sector. It also imposed an income tax penalty, which is an increase in the income tax, and he pretends that it's not. Um, so, you know, this man raised taxes uh, in just about every way he could. Beyond the uh, the uh, Romney care and the uh, taxes uh, issue, uh, what what were something else, other things that he was involved with? You mentioned he had something about a gun fee. Uh, how was he on uh, personal liberty? Um, terrible. He uh, he. Uh, of course, you know he'll go out get photo ops while he's hunting with somebody to try to convince the gun community that he's friendly to gun owners, but he was very anti-gun. There was a bill that had been passed in the House to undo some of the very onerous anti-gun laws in Massachusetts, and he firmly, flatly opposed it. I supported it when I ran for governor as a libertarian. He and the Democrat were equally in vehement opposition to that gun freedom bill. All right, Carla. Uh, so uh, he didn't run for re-election. Uh, was there a reason for that? Well, besides his obvious longstanding ambition to be president, it's very possible he would not have been re-elected. His lieutenant governor uh, 
Carrie Healy ran for governor after he left in 2008, and she lost uh, decisively to the Democrat, who is now um, the governor and uh, reelected incumbent. So it's not clear that he would have been able to maintain the seat. It's not clear how much the the conservatives in the state, the states, the independents, libertarians, fiscally conservative Republicans, many of whom strongly dislike mandated medical insurance, um, may have, if not opposed him, set out the race, giving him, um, causing him to lose enough percentage points in the vote that he may not have been able to hold on to his seat in, in a uh, contest for re-election. So it was sort of a a perfect move for him to get out of the state, avoid having to run again, and run as president 2008, building towards his current 2012 campaign for president. All right, uh, Carla, uh, we got a couple of minutes left here. Uh, what lessons do people who see Mitt Romney running for president now, can you teach them about your firsthand knowledge about him in Massachusetts? Um don't believe a word the man says if it has anything to do with pretending to be for freedom. He talks about being, um, you know, Mr. Uh, Want to Create Jobs. Well, he his policies were the direct opposite. He created some government jobs, but for every one government job you create, you throw two, two private sector people out of work on average, and he did a whole lot of that in Massachusetts, destroying small businesses. They were literally businesses having to close or move out of the state because of his insurance mandates because of high taxes and spending that he sustained and increased. Um, he's hostile to small businesses. He imposed higher business property taxes. Um, he may increase the sales tax indirectly. Uh, he increased dozens of fees. There's people who underwrite mortgages, independent businessmen and women who now pay thousands of dollars in professional fees because of Mitt Romney uh, when he was governor of Massachusetts. So, you know, this man is the exact opposite of what the economy needs to get it back on its feet. We need somebody who not only, you know, talks the rhetoric of uh, getting the government off your back, but who actually does that rather than putting the government more on your back, which is exactly what is Mitt Romney's track record. All right, uh, Carla Howie, I have less than a minute left. Again, if people go to www.lp.org, they can learn more about the Libertarian Party. Uh, in about 30 seconds, tell us why should people learn about the Libertarian Party and get involved with it? The Libertarian Party is the only party in this country that is 40 years old and dedicated to actually shrinking government and running candidates for that purpose. I encourage you to visit lp.org. Uh, encourage you to come to Las Vegas to our convention the first weekend in May and be one of our delegates or just one of our guests and, and have a ball, see a bunch of great libertarian speakers, meet a lot of libertarians and like-minded people, and, and help to non nominate our candidate for 2012. It's going to be great. If you can't make it, go to lp.org and get involved in your local state Libertarian Party. All right, Carla Howell, Executive Director of the Libertarian Party, thank you for joining us here on Live and Let Live. You're welcome. Have a great night.